OK, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Historic Preservation Fund end of year report review. Um, my name is Megan Brown. I'm chief of the state tribal local plans and grants division. Um, and we're today going to go over some reminders of how to uh, finish up your end of year report and close out your grants. Um, and I just want to, uh, as far as the logistics go, remind you that we're using um, Microsoft Live, and that means uh, we you won't actually be able to unmute and speak with us, but you can put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and so please do uh, put those in there and we'll have staff that will be responding to those throughout the presentation. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So the purposes of the uh, end of year report is really to show us how you, the State Historic Preservation Office, is performing in the eight program areas that are required by the National Historic Preservation Act. So you're going to be telling us the work you've done, what was accomplished with the funding, how you spent it, if you had any issues with spending it, um, if you redirected any funds, things like that, and making sure that all of the conditions of the grant agreement were met. Um, this may, this helps us know that the work is being done accordingly and that we're being fiscally responsible with the federal funding that's been provided to us. So to give you kind of a bit of a refresher on our division, um, we've had a few staffing changes. Some of you may have worked with Ginger Carter in the past. Um, she recently left us uh, for, for a new job. So um, we are shifting around a little bit this year. So um, you still have me as the chief. Um, our grant management specialist you can see listed here, uh, Lindsay, James, Marla, Jessica, Madeline, Demetra, and Seth. And you will be hearing from uh, Seth and Madeline today uh, during the training as well as myself. And um, then our other staff uh, still includes David Banks. Um, Dara Green has joined us in the, this past summer as the program assistant, and she'll be kind of running the live show here today. Um, John Renault, uh, Camille Vincent just started with us uh, this week, I think, <laughs> as our second program assistant. Uh, Jennifer Wellock still is our, our lead technical reviewer, and Olivier Brune and Jean Stoll have joined us as our, our pre historic preservation contractors to assist uh, Jen with her um, technical reviews. Um, we also have a, uh, a strong group of fellows and assistants that help us with the various programs. So you might be working with any of the staff uh, throughout the course of your, your grants that you have with us. So with the departure of Ginger um, and Josh in the past year, two years, um, we have made some shifts to who your state grant managers are. Um, we're pleased that Marla Collum, who was one of our term employees, has now uh, assumed a permanent position. Um, and so she will be taking over some states, um, as well as those of you that had uh, Jen Wellock as your reviewer, she is going to be focusing on technical review. Um, and so uh, Madeline Kahn's will be uh, assuming her states. So you can see the map here and we'll definitely be sharing this with you and reaching out to you um, about who has what, uh, but there'll be a bit of a shift. And um, for those of you that have been stuck with me as your grant manager, it means I won't have quite as many states. So hopefully that is good news. But if you have any questions, um, just feel free to reach out on this. So just as a, a kind of quick reminder, um, all of your grants are, have a two year life and that's changed a little bit with COVID, but that is the uh, situation we're trying to achieve that you have uh, two years to expend the money. Um, so that means you have two grants going at the same time and you can see this kind of handy diagram that shows the overlap. Um, so what that means is you're going to, you ideally are closing out this year, your 2019 grant. Um, and then reporting to us in the first year of your 2020 grant. And then you'll be applying for your 2021 grant. Um, just to touch quickly on 2021, our last news on that is we are going to have another week of continuing resolution. Uh, so we don't have a firm budget yet, but as soon as we have that, we'll be getting those um, planning numbers out to you as quickly as we can. Um, for those of you that might have gotten a COVID extension, and there are several of you, um, 
just as a reminder, the Park Service has to extend the whole grant. So even if you just needed the extension for one or two CLD grants that weren't able to start on time, we still have to extend the whole grant. Um, I would advise you to do all of your reporting and all your paperwork like you have completed the grant, um, and then all you have to monitor going forward is those uh, CLG grants that might still be going on. Um, so you still need to file and submit an end of year report at the end of December. Um, so please make sure that's taken care of. You do not need to do a carryover statement. And in fact, the system won't allow you to do that. It will only let you do a carryover statement for 2020. Um, you will need to submit a 425, but instead of marking it final, please make sure it's marked interim and show us the status of your spending. Um, you'll need to submit a 428A, and it's fine to mark that no equipment purchased if that's the case. Um, and then you need to update the PADB. So if you're complete, you should be completed with in-house projects most likely, um, completed most, maybe all or you know, almost all of your CLG subgrants. Um, so that we would expect to see the PA to be updated like you're kind of closing out 2019, except for those elements that are carrying over. So when you are ready to close 2019, and I would encourage you to do it uh, earlier rather than later if you can, um, please make sure that you update the project activity database. Um, you're going to close out those subgrants that that have continued um, and and update the funding. We are aware that it only lets you do fiscal year one and two. Um, so please just update any expenditures under fiscal year two for your subgrants. You're going to submit a 425 again, marked final. This will hopefully show that you've expended all of the funds um, at that time. And a submit a 428B, and that's the final two. Again, if you haven't purchased any equipment, just please mark no equipment purchased. And then you'll also submit to us any products that were produced. And we'll talk a little bit more how to submit those products again. So hopefully that provides a little clarification on, um, on how to handle an extended grant since there's several of you that have those. And so just as a, a kind of quick reminder, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Seth. Um, we are in a completely digital situation. Our staff is still working at home and we anticipate that will not change. So please, any communication that you're giving to us, please submit that via email or through the HPF online. So because um, we're, we're really fairly lucky with the SHPO program because we really are almost digital with it. Um, so just as a reminder of what goes in your HPF online, the project activity database, you'll do the 10% reporting to your CLGs, um, fill out your unexpended carryover table, um, or carryover statement, sorry. Um, the non-federal matching report, you will still be reporting on 2019 and we are not expecting you to provide an update for that. So please, uh, if it's extended, so please just go ahead and submit the matching share report like you're closing out your 2019 grant and we will we will deal with that uh, with the extensions. Um, you're going to complete your cumulative products tables. Please make sure you do fill out the planning cumulative products table. That's no longer optional. Um, and then your success stories are important to us. And I think Sas can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, submitted by email to your grant manager. We still want to we need to see the 425, the 428, your signed carryover statement because we still we haven't been able to make that available for signature in the system yet and then any final reports that you have or um, final products that you have um, many of you are in grant solutions and have experimented with it and uh, you probably know more than we know at this point um, this year we are making grant solutions optional uh, moving forward, we will have to use it for 2021 so you may want to get used to it but if you are having trouble um, please don't let that delay you submitting your reporting. Um, and you're welcome to go ahead and email those forms uh, that don't go in the HPF online to your grant manager as you have in the past. Um, but then next year, we will have to all figure it out together. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Seth Tinkham to talk more. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank Good you, morning. Megan. Good morning. Um, again, as Megan said, my name is Seth Tinkham. Um, I am, oh, I'm currently looking at myself. <laughs> um, I am a grant management specialist um, uh, with the State Tribal Local Plans and Grants Division. Um, and the slide that we're looking at right now is just a comparison between uh, two major parts of HPF Online that you're going to be filling out um, for uh, the end of year report. 
<clears throat> um, one is the cumulative products table, and the other one is the project activity uh, database. So they are uh, kind of mutually reinforcing in that the project activity database is the qualitative, the descriptive data, and the cumulative products table contains quantitative uh, data that illustrates um, using numbers what the project activity database entries illustrate using words. Um, as Megan said, the cumulative products table um, includes the planning uh, program area, uh, which is no longer optional, um, but it also includes every program area because we want to see, um, again, kind of on a statistical basis, what work you're doing in each program area. So if you talk about work that you're doing in the project activity database, um, that needs to be captured in the appropriate cumulative products uh, table. Uh, next slide, please. So just to go a little bit more in depth into the project activity database, um, we want to obviously see that there is a, a complete entry for um, every project that is in there, whether it's an in-house project, a subgrant, or a contract. Um, we uh, also want to make sure that we're able to fully understand the work that you're doing. So that's having a, a descriptive title and a project description, as well as for any projects that are closing, um, please make sure to fill out the project results section. That's a newer field, but it allows us to be able to capture um, what you said you were going to do in the project description and then what you actually did <clears throat> in the in the results section. And overall, all we are looking for here is, is a project um, eligible uh, measurable and, and tangible. <clears throat> um, some other fields that are important to keep in mind in addition to the results field um, are uh, below the property address. Please make sure that the National Register ID number is entered, also called the NRIS reference number. If the entry there is zero, we interpret that to mean that the resource is not listed in the National Register. A little bit further down in the project activity database, please make sure to check the project sign required checkbox for development projects. <clears throat> and while you're there, take a look to make sure that the NHL, CLG, and NEPA required checkboxes are appropriately completed. Um, there are now um, three total areas to focus on. Um, relative to easements. So if you are doing a development project, just make sure that you're focusing on entering, uh, uh, well, checking the easement required or easement agreement checkbox to show that an easement is required. Um, note below that the entity that's holding the easement as well as the easement expiration date. So those are the three fields that need to be entered um, if there's an easement uh, covenant or preservation agreement associated with the work that you're doing. Uh, please make sure to double check the congressional district for the project location. Um, and uh, lastly, just make sure to double check um, that if the uh, project is greater than or equal to $25,000, that you've checked not only the FAFADA required checkbox, but also the FAFADA completed checkbox as an indication to us that you, you know you needed to report it to FSRS and that you have uh, done that um, if uh, if, if required. Madeline's going to talk more about um, that later. Um, in addition to um, uh, FAFADA and FSRS, um, at the very bottom of the, of the individual project activity database page for a project, if you need to submit a final project report or other deliverable from an NHL or really any other project, um, you can upload that now directly into or onto the PADB entry via the file attachment field at the bottom of the page. Um, and Madeline will talk more about uh, submitting digital products later um, as well. Um, so just globally, when we're looking at the project, uh, the project activity database, um, not only do we want to see that the project status is accurate um, for FY19, that tends to be that projects are completed or closed or canceled, um, although that may not be the case if you have an extension. Um, 
but the really the big thing to emphasize is that all eight program areas are covered in all of your active grants um, and uh, that you are explaining any major differences between what you thought you were going to do and what you actually ended up doing right there on the project activity database in addition to saying if there is a significant uh, or really any rebudgeting of funding we need to know um, how that uh, funding is being spent uh, and just one last reminder um, Again, for the end of year report, we are talking about uh, final project reports for NHLs. The end of year report really is not the time to be submitting project notifications because um, those should have occurred at the start of a project involving an NHL and really need to be approved um, before uh, project work begins. Um, and I'm just going to pause to see here if there are any uh, questions related to the project activity uh, database. Um, so one question is, do all of the fields get filled out in the PADB? Um, some activities do not have a specific resource involved. No, if, uh, an act if a project or activity uh, is not associated with a specific National Register listed resource or a National Historic Landmark, then there is no need to put uh, an entry in the NRIS field. Um, and I think that is pretty much it. Uh, so next slide, please. So in order for us to really understand the work that's being done, um, we need to make sure that there is um, not only a descriptive uh, or a, a well-written project description, but also a well-written uh, project title. So this first slide here shows examples of project description. Um, the good project description um, it enables us to have a complete sense of the work that was done. Uh, you'll see that it, it also kind of leads into a potential cumulative products table entry. Now, that's not 100% accurate for this specific example because it's National Register and the corresponding National Register entry in the cumulative products table is going to focus more on um, listings of, of resources or, or districts. Um, but what's good about this, for example, is that um, it says that the uh, State Review Board held three review board meetings. So that is a, a nice kind of narrative summary of the type of information that you could capture in the cumulative products table. So a good example relative to planning might be, you know, we're going to um, host three in-house planning sessions or five community planning meetings. So put that in the description in the project activity database, but then also make sure to put that quantitative data in the cumulative products table. Um, an inadequate project description really doesn't tell us or give us the information we need to be able to understand what you're doing or whether it's eligible. So to continue with the example on this slide relative to National Register activity, continue adding properties, properties to the National Register doesn't really give us the information to understand um, what you're doing. Uh, next slide, please. And much like I was saying that the project description needs to be uh, enough for us to understand the work that's being undertaken. So does the uh, project title. Um, so to just indicate the location of a resource or the subgrantee is not an acceptable project title because it doesn't tell us what the what the project is doing. And so when we're reviewing it, we won't have a sense of what's going on in the city of Danville, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, we have mostly been talking here about the project activity database, and uh, right now we're talking about the comprehensive statewide preservation plan, um, but there is a relationship between the preservation plan and the project activity database. Um, right now we've stepped over into the side of HPF online that deals with just the state plan and entering objectives. Um, so this is just a reminder to please make sure that your objectives are entered and that they're entered correctly and that you do not ever delete any past objectives. Um, when I say that the objectives are entered correctly, what I mean is that they are listed with the plan year, the goal number, the goal, and any objective number and the objective. And it's a it's a bit of a data entry. I, I certainly recognize that, um, but that under, under that enables us to understand the relationship between the goals, the objectives, and the projects that you have tagged that way. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so we're just highlighting here how to add a new objective. Um, and the reason that we're talking about this is to bring things back to the project activity database. Um, because in the project activity database, um, you need to tag each project with a minimum of one uh, goal or objective from your approved state plan. You may do up to three, um, but you don't need to do three. So if there's only one that fits, it's OK to just put one. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're hopping over to the cumulative products table, which, like I said, are uh, spaces to enter the more quantitative data uh, that illustrates the work that you all have been doing. Um, again, just for the second or third time, a reminder that there needs to be an entry for um, every program area, and that's how the cumulative products tables are broken down is program area by program area. And we want to see here at the end of year report um, a comparison between the estimates that you submitted at the time of application and the actual work that you've accomplished by this end of year report. If there is a significant difference, you can now enter that uh, within each report, and that would be a great help to us um, to have you just very briefly, it doesn't have to be an essay, but just an indication of why your planned projections were different from your actuals. Uh, and uh, although that has always been um, a way to help us understand the work that you're performing. 2 CFR 200 is really uh, shifting all federal financial assistance more towards uh, kind of performance based monitoring, and this will help um, all of us fulfill our reporting requirements. So if you could please focus on that, that would be a big help. Um, as I've mentioned before, the there is a fundamental relationship between the cumulative products table and the project activity database. There are, however, um, three tables within the cumulative products table set for which the Park Service will enter data in some fields. And those uh, areas of the table are local government certification or CLG, um, the federal tax incentive program, and also some national register data. We already have that data, so we don't ask you to report it to us. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if as you are filling out the cumulative products tables, you see significant departures from what you planned. That may be a good indication of something that you want to illustrate with a success story. Um, for example, if you had to make plans uh, for review and compliance activities based on what you thought was going to happen, but the US military undertook major operations in your state and that caused a huge uptick in 106 review, um, you might want to talk about that as a success story. Um, so uh, a next slide, please. Seth, we have a question. Yes. Um, if we have a longish list of projects for each program area, should they be all entered under one screen or given separate entries? Um, I think the the answer is we really want to see an entry for each project. Um, you may have a unique situation where you could combine some things into an entry, but I would have I would reach out to your grant manager and have a conversation about that uh, specifically if you have something a little bit different than the norm. Seth, you yes. want to add it? Yeah, the only thing I would add is that um, absolutely you want to have separate project activity database entries if these projects are development. Um, because of how we have to review development grants and the requirements for development grants, they really should not be combined with others, other activities. That's all I would add. Any other questions that I've missed? Let's see, I don't think so. That's all I'm seeing right now. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, I do see one question. So um, the entire focus of today's conversation, uh, the entire focus of the end of year report that we are currently talking about is for your annual formula grant to the State Historic Preservation Office. So um, what we are looking to see here is the accomplishments that you have done um, for your office as a whole, for for some areas, but um, really focusing on um, the the two grants, your 2019 and your 2020 grant. So um, 
for example, if you are doing project work that is funded by an underrepresented communities grant or a disaster grant, um, that would not be captured in the project activity database, for example. Anything else you want to say about that, Megan? Um, I, I will say I do have some states that do include their underrepresented or their civil rights grant just because um, just because they are working on those as a state office and that's okay um, just you may not be closing those out so just make sure we understand clearly that it is one of those uh, projects and that you know that's part of your involvement especially if you're, you're the grantee it's, it's okay to include those if you want to but you don't have to yeah i guess i was just saying more from a money standpoint that that those dollars don't get captured in this report yeah those are usually when i see um a project grant mentioned it's as an in-house project so you're involved in the um kind of 106 side of things and things like that so yeah that's a good point yeah so i don't know who ants asked the question about um reporting on the harvey irma maria disaster grant but um I hope that we have uh, answered what you asked. Um, CLG pass through. Megan, would you like to take this or should I? Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking for here normally in a normal year is are you meeting your 10% uh, pass through to CLGs? I mean, it is 10%, it's not 9.99. Um, so the figure here must be greater than or equal to 10.0% uh, with are discovering any errors as you are working through this. Um, it's a mathematical calculation. So usually it doesn't mean that there's a problem with the database. It tends to mean that there's a problem with um, how a, a subgrant or other activity has been uh, tagged in the database. So you may just wish to hop over to the project activity database uh, and double check that all projects involving a CLG that you are trying to count towards your 10% pass through um, <clears throat> have been identified as, as CLGs by checking, uh, by checking that box. Um, okay, so next slide. And I think we are heading over to Megan to discuss the carryover statement. Okay, um, yeah, so we kind of touched on this a bit earlier when we talked about the COVID extensions, um, but for your carryover statement, um, you will you will only complete this for your 2020 grant. Um, so that is, uh, that will be the amount of the, what you're really entering in this uh, system is the amount, the cost incurred for the first fiscal year. Um, so that's the main uh, number that you enter and the system then computes the rest of it itself. Um, so you'll want to make sure um, because it draws from as such so the project activity database, um, that's where it's going to pull the amount you can see in red that's committed to subgrants. Um, so if you don't have your planning amount in there correctly, um, then that amount's not going to be correct. And then it also does the calculation or what is left for you to carry over. Um, then it computes down at the bottom, the percentage, and as many of you know, and some of you may not know, um, we do have uh, guidance and, and regulation that asks that you only carry over 25% into the second year. Um, we realize that uh, it's very hard to meet that with the lateness of appropriations. So what we ask is you just give us a reason for carryover, should you be hitting that. Um, and that is unfortunately becoming a very common occurrence um, that you may be carrying over, say 40, 50, even 60%. Um, again, this doesn't include your subgrants, so it's operational money that you're carrying over. So just please give us a, a reason in the, um, in the form if you are carrying over. If you're under 25%, you're golden and you don't have to do anything but print out this form and sign it and then email it to your grant manager. Um, and we do anticipate seeing that you're going to have some carryover issues with COVID and other things going on. All right. Seth, back to you. Thank you. Um, there is a question about um, capturing uh, eligible, National Register eligible properties in survey in the cumulative products table. Um, 
And I believe that should already be possible because the cumulative products table related to survey and inventory has um, allows you to enter data on survey activities, both funded by HPF and not funded by HPF, um, and then broken down by type of survey as well. Hello, Madeline or Megan, do you have anything to add about capturing National Register eligible property survey in the cumulative products table? No, I think if you have questions about that again, have a chat with your grant manager and we can help you understand where things could go. Uh, okay, so back to the project activity database now. So um, the images that we're looking at on this slide are taken from two separate spaces, actually. One is the carryover statement from the project activity database, and the other part that we're looking at at the bottom of the screen is an excerpt from the SF425. So from the SF425, we actually are zooming in and focusing on just a detail, uh, and that detail is showing um, block 10 of the SF425, and it's showing lines D through uh, K, actually. Um, the key items to focus on uh, for right now, though, are actually lines D through H, um, which is just talking about um, the federal dollars and the federal share of what you have uh, been uh, expending uh, throughout this year. Um, so the uh, fundamental kind of correspondence between the uh, HPF online and the SF425 is that they're supposed to be mutually reinforcing because they're talking about the same things. Um, and the HPF online just provides us with a greater sense of detail and more information about what you're doing. And one way that we check to make sure that all activities are captured and reported on consistently is by reconciling the project, excuse me, HPF online with the SF425. So that's really what we're doing here. So that the costs incurred first fiscal year recorded in HPF online, um, which show up on the first line of the carryover statement with a green box around them, those correspond to line 10E on the SF425 federal share of expenditures. Uh, committed subgrants and contracts. Uh, so in other words, what you've planned to do, it's an unexpended balance to be carried over. Um, that corresponds to line F uh, on the SF425, federal share of unliquidated obligations. It's, it's another way to think about it is bills outstanding but unpaid. So you know this is coming due, you just haven't paid it out yet. And then uncommitted carryover is carryover that hasn't been kind of allocated in a way. So that's going to be line 10 H on the SF425. Um, and then everything, of course, needs to relate to the total uh, of your grant, um, which is uh, recorded in HPF online and then appears um, as line 10 D on the SF425. Uh, and the uh, kind of key result here is that we are just looking to monitor that 25% uh, carryover, uh, like Megan said, um, but things are going to be different this year. So now to take another perspective and just zoom all the way out, and we're looking at most of the SF425. Just a note here. Um, it seems likely that reporting using grant solutions will become mandatory um, in the future. Um, if you would like to, at your own option, submit uh, the SF-425 using grant solutions, you may, um, but that's not a requirement at this time. However, it could be a way to kind of do a trial run this year. So you may just wish to check with your grant manager and see what, what they're thinking, um, but this option does exist this year. So uh, the reason I bring that up is that we're looking at the print version of the SF-425, which is slightly different from the way it appears uh, in Grant Solutions. Um, but just as a reminder, as Megan said, an SF-425 needs to be submitted for each and every grant, um, regardless of whether or not it's closing or there's been an extended an extension or whatever. Um, so if your grant is closing, um, remember to check final under block six, which is report type. If the award is not closing, check annual under block six. Um, please remember to enter your grant number in block two. Um, your grant number is sometimes also called the FAIN or F-A-I-N. And your grant number starts with the P as in Paul. Um, under block seven, uh, remember to indicate the basis of your accounting and your choices there are gonna be cash or accrual. 
Um, and uh, just to kind of go through it a little bit more line by line, um, under block 10 is where you're going to be entering the majority of your information. Um, for those of you that are, operate on a, a cash basis, it's a bit more straightforward. Um, but for everyone, line 10A is going to be what you have drawn down from uh, ASAP. 10B will depend on uh, whether you're cash or accrual, the, what you show there. For example, if you're a cash basis for your accounting, 10B is going to be what you have uh, should match what you've drawn down from ASAP um, because you're paying that out as soon as you draw it down. Um, if you don't, we'll need to know uh, why. So just put a brief note there. Um, but to move on to section uh, kind of 10D uh, and then recipient share uh, below that, um, as uh, we talked about on the last slide, <clears throat> 10D is your total grant amount. 10E is bills outstanding but unpaid. Uh, 10 F is kind of that carryover, you know, what you've spoken for, what you've programmed, but haven't expended yet. Um, and then 10 H is going to be um, that unobligated or unkind of spoken for money. 10 I is total recipient, recipient share. That's your matching share. Uh, so that needs to be what is on your grant agreement. Um, 10 J is recipient share of expenditures. Those, that's your actual match that you've uh, expended. And if you want to overmatch, that's fine. Um, but it needs the figure there, um, if you're closing your grant, needs to be um, greater than or equal to what you said uh, in your grant agreement. If you do have program income, please make sure that is entered in line 10 L, M, N, or O as appropriate. Uh, and if you do have uh, indirect expenses or have elected the 10% de minimis, please make sure to indicate that on line 10, uh, uh, block 11, uh, excuse me. Um, if you would like to have a practice version of this, or you would like to submit uh, submit it by email and not using grant solutions. A copy of the SF-425 is available in HPF online. Under the menu on the left-hand side, uh, there's a menu item called HPF forms, and you can find this there. Uh, next slide, please. Seth, we had one question real quick. Um, it was, our carry ever includes contracts that are not subgrants. How does that get pulled in? So if you're doing a contract, you should still be entering that as if it's a subgrant. It it actually says subgrants and contracts. We just usually refer to it as subgrants because we don't see you doing as many contracts. But you should be entering that if it's a external um, money expenditure like that to execute a project. Then you should also be entering that in the um, PADB as well. Uh, great. Yes, and I'm also seeing. Um, that uh, Andrea from, I think, Pennsylvania uh, wanted a quick revisit of the questions in the Q&A, um, which we can try to do at a, at a later point. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Non-federal matching share report. Um, so what we're looking at here, um, in a, again, in a normal world, would be uh, the closing year only cumulative for the entire period of the award uh, and this is used to verify that you're meeting your 40 percent matching share requirement and that the matching share is coming from allowable sources um, as of uh, right now uh, we do not have information that would allow us to be able to use cares act funding as match um, if that changes we'll let you know but for right now uh, we are under the impression that it cannot be used as match. Um, the most common and easiest source of federal dollars that um, is readily available to be used as match is uh, community development block grants or CDBG money. Um, other sources of match need to be tracked, however, on the matching share report. Uh, and the main ones that we look for are um, federal, other federal dollars, like I said, nonprofit, uh, commercial, or, or private funds. Um, 
they uh, need to be um, identified not only in terms of a dollar uh, amount right there, um, but uh, for some of them, we need to know actually what the source of that is. So um, sources of match that require more information are match coming from educational institutions, nonprofits, commercial organizations, or private funding. And you can actually enter right now um, on on the matching share report information about uh, the source of those funding. So you don't need to send that as a separate email or, or anything. You can put that directly into uh, HPF online. Um, and the figure that uh, the total on the non-federal matching share report, um, it needs to match what's on the, the SF-425. Uh, and this is just an illustration of that uh, right here. So um, the uh, background image is a list of all subgrant projects uh, within the PADB, um, and it's showing uh, a highlighted the matching share expended to date of $44,646.52. Uh, and that gets translated over to um, the certified local government line in the in the matching share report um, but you can see that there are other sources that are there for example um, there this particular report shows uh, about six hundred and forty thousand dollars in match that's coming uh, from the state it looks to be the state of Florida in 2013 so just a few short years ago um, uh, but uh, uh, that is kind of the relationship between everything and then in the background um, is uh, just a, a snip from an SF-425 um, that shows that the total match that is on the non-federal matching share report sums to $687,844. And then that rolls over and gets captured onto um, the SF-425 um, as you enter it there in, under the recipient share uh, uh, lines on the SF-425. Uh, and with that, I believe we are headed over to the SF-428 series with Madeline. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Madeline Kahns, and um, I'm just going to go over some additional requirements for your end of year reporting. Um, and we're going to start with the SF-428 series. Um, as you all know, or you should know, that any equipment purchases that you make um, that are $5,000 or more per unit um, such as a vehicle or some large um, printer, that type of thing, um, you need to get approval from your grant manager first. But in addition to that approval, um, you also need to report on it yearly. So um, there's the 428 series equipment reporting here. And as you can see, there's uh, four different forms. Um, one is the cover sheet. One is the SF-428A, which is required for your active year grant. That would be your fiscal year 2020 grant. The SF-428B, also required, is for your closing grant, um, the uh, fiscal year 2019. And then um, SF-428C is if you want to dispose of the property. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, we'll do a quick overview of the SF-428A. Um, again, this is the um, form that you would need to fill out if you're reporting on your uh, open grant. Any equipment that you purchased on this grant, you would list here for your fiscal 2020 grant. Even if you didn't purchase any equipment, you still need to submit this and then you can just put no equipment purchased on the, uh, the document. Or um, if you have purchased equipment, make sure that you include um, serial number. Now, another note is, is that when you do purchase equipment with um, HPF money, you must remember to keep track of it, um, and that should be in your files. Um, you'll need the serial number because that will transfer with the property, either to the next grant or um, to some other entity. Um, uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, now the SF-428B is for your final report. This would be your closing grant, um, fiscal year 2019. Um, if you are not closing your 2019 grant, then you will submit another SF-428A. So if you have an extension, you'll be submitting two SF-428As, one for your 2020 grant and one for your 2019 grant. But if you're closing your 2019 grant, then you would submit the SF-428B and you would fill it out as um, um, noted here. And again, if you don't have any property, you would just, um, purchased with that grant, you would just put none of the above. Um, again, even if nothing was done. So next slide, please. Okay, 
the SF-428C is the disposition request. Um, if you're disposing of the property, you're no longer keeping it for the same use that you purchased it for, then you would need to fill this out and submit it to your grant manager at um, any time. If the value of the item that you're um, disposing of is $5,000 or more. If the value is under $5,000, then um, we you don't need to report on it any longer. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can uh, check with your grant manager. But you still may have some property that's older than the grant, such as a 2018 grant that you purchased a vehicle on, and that still retains a value of over $5,000, then you'll need to report on that. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so we have a few additional um, things that you need to submit with your end of year report. Um, one is the success stories. We require that you submit three success stories. So always keep thinking about this. We, we love hearing about what, uh, what programs and projects have been um, exceptional for you. And we get the benefit of sharing that and supporting it. We, we support it to executives, um, Congress. We share it on our Facebook page and other social media. So please make sure that you uh, submit your three success stories and we'll be asking about those. Um, make sure that you submit any products that were produced under the grant. Um, in order to do this, um, there's a digital, um, you'll, you'll be submitting them digitally and uh, you would need to contact us to give you a link, which is um, the FTP link, which is your file transfer protocol link. And um, that way, if you have huge files, we can upload them easily and uh, we won't be having trouble with email. And uh, so you can you can ask for that. Now, the submission guidance is at the end of your grant agreement. So if you have any questions about that, you can you can reference it there. However, if you need a copy, um, reach out to uh, the Steel Pig um, main email and we'll send you a copy or your grant manager. Uh, just a quick overview of some of the things that we um, would need to see that the products that you have um, produced with the grant, um, like historic structure reports or design guidelines, um, those treatment reports, those types of things, um, substantive event materials such as program proceedings, photographs, love photographs, handouts, um, professionally produced content, of course, like books, or oral histories, other PSAs, uh, posters, um, interpretive projects, which would be a poster, more books, lesson plans. If you've done any kind of educational outreach, that's that's good. Um, online content, including websites, story maps, and that type of thing. Um, we don't need to see everything though. Like we we certainly don't need any flash drives or DVDs. Um, just um, through the uh, FTP site. Um, restricted reports that can't be viewed by the public. Um, survey forms, um, huge archaeological reports, um, that type of thing. Um, also on the digital um, worksheet, um, we do have a naming convention, so um, Please name your files. Um, that's listed there. I'm not going to go through it right now, but it's listed in your um, your guidance document. Um, also, please include an index so that um, we we know what it is that you are, what programs and what these materials are. Um, you do not need to submit anything to Irma. MPS will do that um, as we go through and as you submit your products to us. And I think that's about it on that. Oh, wait, so we have your special conditions. Um, if you have anything in your grant agreement that may be special to you, perhaps you have some kind of audit requirement or findings that need to be um, addressed, uh, make sure that all of those things have been done. It might also be like a CLG requirement that's special to your state. Um, your grant manager will be checking to make sure that that, that condition has been met. So please re read your grant agreement and double check those. And Last, uh, make sure that your um, your historic preservation plan is current and David Banks can help with that or he would have reached out to you about that. Next slide, please. OK, um, 
Seth touched on this a little bit earlier about your federal subboard reporting system requirement. Um, all subgrants have to, also grants and contracts have to be reported to this system if they're $25,000 or more. Um, please check to make sure that that has been done. Um, if you don't, if that isn't something that you're responsible for, please check with the department or um, office in your organization that does that. Um, your grant manager will be checking to make sure that it has been um, entered and it is showing up. Um, we understand that it may, the threshold of $25,000 may increase to $30,000 or has increased to $30,000, but we do, we don't have any guidance on that right now. So um, as of right now, it is $25,000 and on this grant closing, um, that's um, how much you would need to make sure that your threshold meets. Uh, next slide, please. OK, um, we talked about grant solutions earlier, too, and um, we're all learning this process, so that's why we have a little bit of a transition here. We're allowing you to um, email your financial forms, but next year they will be on grant solutions. Um, we've entered here information on the training. Um, also, if you're Nate, you should have received information um, already from Grant Solutions. We submitted all the SHPO names, so you should have received information on your recipient user um, entering and your account um, password and whatnot. Um, uh, we put in here, if you need to add other people, um, you need to submit this um, account user request form and the link is right there. Um, it also includes the rules of behavior acknowledgement and uh, um, the help desk numbers there. If you have any questions about um, grant solutions, they're the ones to ask if it's technical. Um, I, uh, we have some training videos. Um, they're pretty good um, just for your basic um, information and you, you can access that if you haven't already through um, the grant solutions uh, network. Um, next slide, please. OK, as um, you're probably aware of, in August we changed our HPF online access um, due to security um, concerns. We've added um, an additional layer of security and now you're required to enter your username and password. Your username is your work email and your password is unique to you that you've established. Um, you're re uh, responsible for maintaining the security of your account. Um, if you have any issues or you have to reset the password, you can um, email our uh, general grant email, steelpig at mps.gov, and uh, we'll send you a link or we will have that reset for you. Um, we can't view or share your password, so you will have to reset it only. Um, next slide, please. Um, if you are going to request additional accounts or um, closer closures, um, you must have a letter shine, uh, excuse me, signed by the SHPO or TIPO that delegates that authority, and uh, you must clearly state all the information listed here. Um, same thing for removing a user, send it to the uh, general email. Um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can within three days. Um, next slide, please. And here is here is an example of, um, I, and I believe this is on um, in HPF online that you can fill out and the information that we need, and that you would have to sign. So I believe that's it. Did we have any questions about any of the, those things? Let's see. I'm not I'm seeing not anything seeing in the, the chat, chat. Madeline. Okay, great. Um, Megan, did you want to add anything or close us out? Um, sure. Um, we'll echo there. Uh, anyway, I just uh, want to thank you all for your time. Um, we will be um, posting a recording of this webinar so that you're able to uh, access it uh, when you have questions and perhaps when you have trouble sleeping. So um, if again, if you do need uh, anything, please reach out to your grant manager, even though it might be a new one. Um, know that we'll, we're all kind of work as a team. So if uh, we have uh, past history or need to answer questions for a new grant manager, we'll be available for that. And I, I hope this finds you all uh, 
healthy and uh, if we don't talk to you before then please have a, a good holiday and just remember that your reports are due December 31st. Thank you everyone.